Afternoon. How is everybody doing? Are we awake after lunch? Are you sure you're awake after lunch? Maybe. Are you sure? Yes. Only a couple of yeses. Here, let's get everybody to stand up for a second. I'm just kidding. Just sit down. We're done. <laughs> now we're awake. All right. So I'm Brian. Uh, also, CPU guy 83 on Twitter or on Freenode, uh, and you can read my blogs at uh, container42.com. And I'm here to talk about awesome things you can do with Docker. So before I can really talk about that, uh, you should know what I think are awesome. So in no particular order, Doctor Who is freaking amazing. It's my favorite show on TV. Uh, if you don't know what Doctor Who is, you should go look it up. I actually started watching it because I was watching Big Bang Theory and Sheldon mentioned it. I'm like, oh, Sheldon mentioned it. Let me go check it out. So I did. <laughs> so it's a show about a madman with a blue box that goes around and saves the universe with a screwdriver, a sonic screwdriver. So that should be uh, enough for you to go check it out, sonic screwdrivers. Star Wars. I love Star Wars. Even episodes one through three, they were ter terrible movies, but they're still Star Wars, so they're awesome. And if anybody at Disney is watching, I expect the next ones will be much better. And my three beautiful little girls. The baby there will be one tomorrow, so we'll have a nice little birthday party for her, so I actually have to skip out right after the conference so I can fly home. Uh, and then my two oldest there, the middle one and the, the one in the center there just started kindergarten. And the one on the right-hand side, Amelia, she is two, and she is very two. <laughs> if anybody's had a two-year-old, you, you'll know that if that two-year-old says something and you do, do not acknowledge them, they will repeat that same thing over and over and over again until you say, oh, really? And they'll say, yeah. Only my two-year-old, this one in particular, does not do that. She will wait until you actually repeat back what she said to you. And that is a chore because she is almost impossible to understand. <laughs> like when she wants a kind of cereal, she goes and she says, I want caca crunch. And I've learned that that means Captain Crunch. <laughs> so there is a uh, language barrier there to, to pick up, so you, uh, to, to get her to stop repeating herself. And of course, the whole reason I'm here is to talk about Docker. So. Uh, you saw the, those other amazing things, uh, and that's just to show you how amazing I think Docker is. So in case you didn't notice, that, that's me. Everybody else puts their picture on their own slide, so I figured I'd do it too. I don't know why, because you can see me. I have been using Docker since 2013, um, back, well, I guess it's been about a year now. Uh, basically, I was using it at my old company where we were having all kinds of problems with, uh, in particular, having very limited resources to deploy services um, and many services to deploy. In addition, I was the only person in the company doing any sort of tech work. So I was doing sysadmin work, I was doing development, um, everything. So basically if something happened to me, there would be nobody to go, to, to be able to go and uh, reproduce that, that uh, IT infrastructure. So one of the things I set out to do was to make a reproducible environment. So one of the first things I came to was Chef. And I got deep into the Chef community and um, made some pull requests to Chef itself, um, but kind of decided it wasn't really solving my problem. Yeah, it could make some reproducible environments, uh, but we also had other issues, uh, in particular uh, density and even making it easy for a non-developer, someone who does not have an engineering degree, to be able to go and actually make, make those uh, and have any idea what those cookbooks for Chef look like because they're kind of ridiculous. No offense to any Chef people here, but if you've seen a Chef cookbook, they are crazy. I decided to become a Docker employee in June of 2014, uh, pretty much because I, when I discovered Docker, um, I had pretty much kind of dismissed all the hype around it, uh, 
because Docker came out last year. Um, probably it's been about a year and a half now that it's been out. And there was a lot of hype, still is a lot of hype around Docker. Uh, and with those kind of things, I tend to ignore because there's always a lot of hype around all kinds of products and they never deliver on, on their promise. Uh, but what I found was when I did try Docker, it did exactly what I wanted it to do for me. Um, and it did it so well that I kind of decided, well, I need to go and join the team that's, that's making this awesome product. I am a maintainer of just this most minuscule, tiny little piece of the Docker code base. So it's not that amazing, but I at least get to put that on my slide deck. And I have used uh, Docker in production environments. So my uh, experiences with Docker are not just theoretical, like um, a lot of people were that are just trying Docker or they're saying, oh, well, we're gonna put it in our test environments and what have you. I've actually used it in production. And I'm also a crazy, insane introvert. So if you want to talk to me, you're gonna have to come and talk to me. I'm, not gonna, I'm probably not gonna come talk to you, not, no offense to anybody here. Um, I do enjoy talking to people, but I'm not particularly outgoing. So if you do wanna talk, feel free to come. I may be brief, I may be terse, because that's just who I am, but I really am into what you, what you have to say or any questions you have, especially if you wanna talk about Doctor Who or Star Wars or, or uh, Docker. So probably a lot of people here, um, I know even uh, some, some of the people at the speaker dinner last night were wondering what is Docker. They pretty much all have heard about it. How many people have heard about Docker? Everybody. How many people have used Docker? Maybe a third, maybe less than a third. How many people have been onto Docker Hub? About half of the, the third. So Docker is essentially an answer to this. <laughs> this is a crappy uh, way of life for everybody in our industry, be it developers or sysadmins. Every software deployment ends this way, or not ends because you gotta fix it, but every single software deployment goes through this. Every single iteration, every version, this happens, and it's crappy. Some, depending on where you work, maybe the sysadmins feel like the developers are their overlords and just kind of hand them off crap and, and they feel like they're being oppressed. Or maybe it's the other way around where the sysadmins are battle hardened and they've decided they're gonna dictate to the software developers how they're gonna develop software to make their, develop, their deployments easier. And to be honest, every time I see this, I kind of picture that girl in her head going, <laughs> like she did it on purpose. And so, and sometimes that, that can be true after, after many deployments, there's animosity in between uh, developers and operations. And unfortunately, at my last company, Enview, I was both. So I wrote a piece, I wrote some software, and I handed it off to the sysadmin, me, to deploy it. And every single time, it blew up in my face. Even though I knew how I developed it, I knew exactly how to deploy it, still somehow something went wrong. I was missing some dependency on my server, um, what have you. So Docker is for deploying basically anything. It doesn't matter if it's a SQL Server or um, Nginx or Apache or just a set of static files. It can be a build system. It really doesn't matter. It is literally for deploying anything on almost any uh, location. Uh, with the caveat that it's gotta be Linux, so Docker is currently Linux only, uh, although there are some works to be done on getting it running on Solaris zones and uh, BSD jails, but uh, that's a whole other topic. Uh, you can run Docker on uh, VMs or on bare metal. You can run it on any IaaS, such as EC2 or GCE or IBM or insert whatever, or any VPS like um, uh, DigitalOcean or Linode. And it can run on any distro, uh, virtually any distro, because Docker, there's actually some bugs in the, in the Linux kernel that weren't resolved until about 3.8 that we found. Although Red Hat has patched their 2.6.32, so you can run it on Red Hat Enterprise Linux or CentOS or Oracle Linux uh, with the, that kernel version. And there's been some people that have got it running on ARM, in particular Raspberry Pi, but that's completely unsupported. It's kind of up to you to, to try it out, but it's really cool 
to be able to run Docker on a Raspberry Pi. Basically, if it works in one place, it's going to work everywhere else. In production, in a contributor's laptop, and scaled across an entire cluster on an auto scale, on wherever. It will work on uh, two developers' laptops, and maybe somebody discovered a bug that then two developers should be able to reproduce that same bug every time without issue. But how does this happen? We've heard that this thing, uh, this uh, mantra before, I'm sure everybody has. Uh, so here's the problem though. This is why everything blows up every time we do a software deployment. It's because we have all these services that need to be deployed across every single one of these uh, mediums. If you get a public cloud, uh, production cluster, contributor's laptop, some disaster recovery uh, area, everywhere. And we call this the matrix from hell because it is impossible to make this work everywhere all the time. And as it turns out, there is another industry, the shipping industry, that had the same exact problem where maybe they need to, to ship a sack of beans uh, alongside uh, maybe a barrel of chemicals and it's got to go across the ocean so they got to put it on a boat. Um, so the dock workers have to know exactly what's going on in, inside of each of those, uh, like what's in the sacks, what's in the barrels, what's in everything. And they have to make the determination what can sit next to what so you don't have contamination. And in addition to that, it's also their job to make sure they can pack as much as they can on those boats uh, in order to uh, save costs in the shipping. This is also a matrix from hell. They have to ship each one of these items across all of these things, because it's not even just a boat. It's going to be trucks. It's going to be trains. It's going to be all the other tiny little graphics that some, some of them don't really make sense. And the solution to that is a really simple one, kind of, kind of like an oh duh, uh, it's, a, it's a box. It's a big metal box. And I don't remember, I don't know if any of you remember minivans before there was two sliding doors. Back in the day there was one sliding door. Then all of a sudden, maybe 10, 15 years after the minivan was invented, somebody thought, oh, second door. It's the same kind of thing. It's like, oh, let's just put everything in a box. So what this box does is it provides a common interface. The shipper doesn't have to know anything about anything on the inside. The person who is, selling, is shipping the goods can put whatever they want to in there and, not, and know that it's not going to have any interference with the things from the outside. And likewise, the shippers can stack these things up next to, next to each other like Lego blocks and not have to worry about uh, contam contamination. And all, or, also, or density, because these things just stack right up just like Lego blocks. I swear that's my only slide animation. So containers. It turns out you can do the same thing with software. So that's what Docker is. It's a container system for software. So you can put your Nginx inside of a, inside of a container and ship that container across all these different platforms and it will work the exact same way every time. Because you're not just shipping code, you're shipping an environment. And so we're able to package all these things up into containers and distribute them across each of the, uh, each of the platforms. So some, may, some people may be thinking, that's kind of like a VM, is that right? So there's, there's things like Packer where you can take a VM and pack it up to an image and ship it around. So here we, here we have the comparison of a, a VM to a Linux container, uh, which is what Docker uses. So in a, in, a, in a VM, we have a server hardware. We have a host OS such as Ubuntu or, or ESX or whatever. Then you have a hypervisor, such as KVM or ESX. And then you have your VMs, 
which all have their own guest operating systems, their libraries, and then the actual application, which this is a lot of stuff just to get that. And generally, we probably want each of these to be exactly the same. It doesn't always work out that way just because of life and, and having install scripts that don't pin the right versions and what have you. But this is all duplication. It's massive duplication. It's uh, a VM image is d tens of or more, or tens or hundreds in of gigabytes in size. Whereas with containers, we strip away the hypervisor and we strip away the, the guest operating system and we, j we just share those resources from the, from the host amongst all the containers. So we have all these nice isolated environments all with a common interface through Docker. And I know some of this sounds like marketing speak because it's kind of a 101. And uh, it kind of is marketing speak, but it's also kind of not because this is exactly how it works. So each container gets its own process space, its own network interface. You can run things as root. You can limit uh, resources just like you would in a VM. Uh, the difference is you share a kernel with the host. There is no emulation, so uh, pair virtualization or hardware virtualization is gone. And in addition to that, you can even limit the capabilities of the root user inside the container. So root isn't quite as dangerous as a normal root user would be, such as being able to add device nodes or uh, manipulating uh, network interfaces across other containers. Um, what have you. These are all very dangerous things to allow uh, for code to do inside of a container. And the idea is we want to be able to run untrusted code inside of a container. So we limit root capabilities. So we're going to do a demo. So we are going to do, let me clear this out and put this over here. So we are going to tell Docker to run this image called Hello World. And I already had it pre-downloaded. Let me remove the image. Actually. Yes, I can. Just a second. I want to remove that image so you can actually see what's happening. So now I've removed this Hello World image from my system, and we are going to tell Docker to run it again. So what's happening here is it's saying, oh, I don't have this Hello World image, so I'm going to go out to the Docker registry and download it. And hopefully, if the internet works, there we go. And so basically, here's what happened. I am running a Docker client on my Mac. It is talking to a Docker daemon inside a virtual machine because Docker is Linux only, or at least the daemon part is Linux only. Uh, then that told the daemon to go and download the Hello World image from Docker Hub. Then the daemon created a new container from that image and executed the, pro the, uh, the, executed the process that gives this output. And Docker streamed that output, that standard out output, back to my terminal through the, through the client which is pretty freaking amazing. Uh, if, you, if you figure this could very well be an instance on DigitalOcean or whatever, and I'm still running Docker on my Mac, or I'm still running the Docker client on my Mac. Let me get this back up. And actually, I forgot I was gonna do one more thing. And like it says, to try to do this next thing. So there we go. I just booted Ubuntu in an instant. I can apt-get update uh, if I type it right. Yes. Still can't type it right. There we go. And so you can see I've got apt. I've got access to all the entire Ubuntu repository. This is an Ubuntu image that I just booted up in an instant. And I can exit out, and I will do it again. 
just in case you missed it. Docker run Ubuntu. It just booted Ubuntu. That is a different container. It will run it again. So uh, we just created two completely different isolated environments. And I can apt-get install vim.tiny. And there we go. I have vim installed. And so you can see I have a full, uh, a full Ubuntu environment right there. And so in that, I, I kind of mentioned that we downloaded the Hello World image from the Docker index, which is this. It's known as Docker Hub, which has all kinds of different applications on it, including ones that we maintain ourselves, or images for things that we maintain ourselves, or even things that are maintained by the open source uh, contributor, such as CentOS is actually, main, the CentOS image is actually maintained by the CentOS folks. Uh, you can, so basically I can come up here, I can go to, to my terminal and say docker run Redis, and I have an instant Redis in, uh, instance. Same thing with MySQL or Nginx or whatever. Or if you're feeling particularly masochistic, you can do MongoDB or WordPress. So there are over 30,000 Dockerized applications on Docker Hub. Uh, now a Dockerized application is pretty much the same thing as a normal application. It's just been configured to run within a container. Uh, and I say that and we will, I will show you a Dockerized application in a minute. Um, but just know that's, that there is no modification to the application that you have to do to make that happen. Uh, Docker Hub has private repos and automated builds and all these things. Uh, it, and it's pretty much like GitHub, but for Docker. It's not a, it's not a competitor to GitHub. Um, it's completely for managing Docker images and sharing Docker images and what have you. So more what is Docker? Docker is an engine, which is the daemon that I talked about earlier. It, there are over 15,000 stars on GitHub for it and over 600 contributors. It is written in Go and pull requests are welcome. So let's talk about building an image. So this right here is what we call a Docker file. A Docker file pretty much automates the uh, building an image. Uh, so the weird thing about images is images are created from containers, but containers are created from images. So basically everything starts out from uh, what we call a scratch image, which is an, just an empty file system. And then we can load up a file system on there using just, uh, we can use anything like a dev bootstrap to bootstrap a, an Ubuntu instance or an Ubuntu file system and pop it right into the scratch container, but that's going a bit advanced for this. Uh, so here we're saying we want to use the Ubuntu 1404 image and then we're going to run uh, all these commands and uh, we're gonna say when I start a container, I want it to be to run Nginx in the foreground and we're gonna advertise that we're running on port 80. This is really hard to do with two screens. Sorry here. Dang it, I've lost my mouse. There we go. So we'll get out of there. So let's go ahead and build that Docker file. Yeah, it's smaller, sorry. So we're going to hopefully that's all the right. Yep. And we're going to tell it to start Nginx. Uh, now the one thing about Docker is we, we pretty much expect all services to run in the foreground. Uh, the basic idea is you run one service in a container. 
you can run multiple if you like. So you can start up your own init system, like run it, or you, you can even fire up system D within a container if you like. Uh, but generally, w what we practice is to run a single, uh, a single uh, process inside of a container, and then it's a lot easier to monitor that way. So I'm going to tell it to build this image. And there we go, I just built an image. And I'm going to tell it to start up a container and expose a port. And hopefully, um, yes. It is, what it does, uh, so there, um, the build system is able to, it reads the Docker file, and it's able to go and check uh, a set of cache layers, uh, which I can show you in just a second. Basically, each of these entries is doing a commit, it's just similar to like a git commit. And so, this is saying it's running it in a container, and then it's going to commit an image. Uh, and that's the image ID that it did, and then it removed that intermediate container. Uh, where's the cache? There it is. So here it's saying ran in the cache. So basically, it already has an image that, that uh, or an image layer that is Ubuntu 1404, and with that particular entry just below it. It doesn't. So if you ran this, it will use the same cache layer every time until you change something either about Ubuntu or about that line. So if you manipulate something in that line, it'll rerun the, the thing. Or you can tell it to build with no cache. Uh, but ideally, if you're in production, you won't want to pin uh, an Nginx, Nginx version so you don't uh, screw yourself over at some point. So as you can see, I am running that here now. So I exposed port 8080 and porting that to port 80 inside the container. And here is my Docker VM instance uh, on port 8080 and we see hi. And I messed up one of my commands so. There we go. So what's happening here is every one, every one of these entries is creating a new commit to an image. Uh, and we use copy on write layers. So for instance, say you have 1,000 containers all running on top of the Ubuntu image, which is like 250 megabytes. Uh, I should say that again. The Ubuntu image is 250 megabytes. If you go and download that ISO off of Ubuntu's website, it's like 700 megabytes uh, just for the ISO, which is compressed and what have you. This is 250 megabytes for the Ubuntu image because we don't need all the extra stuff that's provided by a, a traditional Ubuntu installation, uh, like network services and what have you. This is all shared from the host. So each one of these layers, uh, each one of these uh, entries is, is creating a commit layer, which is a, a write layer on top of the image. And doing that, we're able to share the same Ubuntu image across multiple uh, containers. So you use that same 250 megabyte image a, a thousand times, and there's, we're not using 250 megabytes a thousand times, we're using 250 megabytes once. And then we create a container, you write, you, we put a write layer on top of that image uh, to, to create that. So uh, when, you, when you write to a container, it's not manipulating the image unless you went and told it to commit this back to that image. I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, it probably if, if I did a demo. So I could really screw up my Ubuntu uh, base image that I have stored on my laptop here by saying docker commit. Uh, I gotta rebuild that. So docker commit.
I'm basically just telling it get that I, that ID for me automatically, and we'll do that to Ubuntu 14.04. So now we're really just going to mess up that Ubuntu 14.04 tag. So now I can say Docker run dash p Ubuntu. it up. So there we go, and if I did this again, it will be running that, even though I just told it Ubuntu, so I kind of screwed up my Ubuntu image. But that's okay, because I can... go and just repull my Ubuntu image. And that might take a few minutes, but uh, so this is all based on what, uh, what we call the official images on Docker Hub, where Docker maintains the Ubuntu image, so it's, uh, if you trust Docker, you, sh you should be able to trust the Ubuntu image. Um, and these get built uh, nightly, so it's always up to date, so like for instance, if there's another, yet another issue with OpenSSL, we will automatically rebuild this and make sure that it's got the right uh, libraries in there. So there are really, there are two ways to build an image. You can run a container, run some, then run some commands inside the container, and then commit that, those, that container back to an image. Or you can use a Docker file, which is the preferred way, to do that automatically. So you can share a Docker file with anybody, and they should get the same exact results no matter where they are, assuming uh, so if it worked for me, it will work for you. Uh, Boot to Docker. Boot to Docker is a very minimal uh, Linux distribution, only 27 megabytes. It boots very quickly, and it has uh, an installer for, for dev environments. Uh, so for, for instance, I'm running Boot to Docker here, where it com comes with a special command line that I can like SSH into it and it sets everything up for me automatically. Uh, and it does have a Docker file. So uh, normally if, if you wanted to go and hack a distribution uh, to make your own, that would be a real pain in the butt. But for uh, Boot to Docker, you just go and you can modify the Docker file for it and, uh, and do that yourself, uh, which I will. So, for instance, here is a Docker file for building uh, boot to Docker. So this is loading up Debian and all these build dependencies and what have you. And eventually what we're doing is we're creating this very tiny ISO, which is built off of tiny core Linux. Uh, and uh, so we create this ISO, which gets out, outputted the standard out when you run it, and you save that ISO for uh, yourself. Uh, so what this is really doing, though, is it's using Docker as a build system. So we don't, we're not running anything here. We're just using this Docker file to build this ISO, so you can grab that ISO and run that outside of Docker. And for instance, I have, uh, I have a need to be able to access my, my files on my Mac. Through, from uh, through boot to docker so I've created I've modified boot to docker to use virtualbox guests uh, additions so I can do the folder sharing for that and that was just super easy to add I didn't, that's the only code that I changed right there so in addition you can also do some crazy things like I also did this but through a container so you have a normal inst installation of boot to docker and you run this image that I have uh, with, these, with these parameters, and it will actually go and build those kernel modules and inject them back into, uh, back into the boot to Docker instance, which is kind of like dynamically including modules, uh, whereas I couldn't do that straight on boot to Docker because there's no tooling, because um, boot to Docker is essentially just Linux, uh, Linux kernel and Docker and some very minor supporting services. Uh, so we recently added uh, container restart policies. So one thing a lot of people do is they use uh, something like Foreman or Monit, which are both terrible, 
uh, or even more recently people use Upstart or System D to monitor their processes and make sure that they stay running. And if a, if a process crashes, System D or Upstart or whatever will restart that. And uh, so you can actually hook those things up into Docker if you want and have, have those tools manage your Docker containers for you. Uh, but with this, you don't need to do that, and it's actually a bit more efficient. Uh, because um, when a container crashes and system D is going to restart it, uh, basically what's going to happen is Docker is going to have to tear down that whole entire container environment, uh, all the network interfaces uh, and everything. And then when system D says to restart it, it will has to recreate all those, those things. But w with Docker uh, and the built-in restart policies, you can uh, it knows that it crashed, and so it's just going to uh, try to reinitialize that process for you instead of tearing things down and rebuilding them up. So these are the, the modes that they support, always, on failure, and never. So you kind of, basically, if, if something exits with zero, with exit code zero, uh, and you have on failure, it will never restart. Or if somebody kills it uh, and you have always, then it will always restart, or you can have it not restart it. Automated builds are really, really awesome. So, it, and actually it turns out that you can do a lot of really cool things with them. Uh, so these are things where, for instance, I've got very many GitHub repos where I have linked to a Docker Hub image where anytime I commit to my, my GitHub account or my GitHub repo, it will send a hook back into Docker Hub. Docker Hub will go pull my repo and build that image for me and then I can go and, and pull it. Uh, and that's really great when you have a team of people. You don't have to build the image multiple, multiple times. You just have to download the image. And we also have webhooks. So uh, basically, this enables you to automatically deploy things, uh, for instance, uh, on git push. So if I push to my GitHub repo, uh, GitHub is going to notify Docker Hub that I have made an update. Docker Hub's going to go and re-pull those changes, build the image, and then go back and notify my server saying, hey, there's a new image, and what do you want to do with this? So for instance, on my blog, uh, Container42, I've got this set up so I can, uh, I'm using uh, Jekyll, so I can write a new post, push it up to GitHub, it will go back to Docker Hub, Docker Hub will come back, and boom, I have uh, an updated site. All I had to do was push uh, a new post to GitHub. Uh, you can use automated builds for tests. So you could technically run your test suite in a build if you wanted to, and if the build fails, you will get notified that it failed, so you would know that your tests failed, which is really cool. Uh, or any number of other things. It's kind of, uh, once you start using it, you, you, you will each individually find your own, uh, your own things to do. This is a really cool project that uh, we just saw a demo for at the office. Uh, nucleotides, it, basically they catalog genome assemblers for scientists so they can rate them. And uh, so there is a really uh, difficult problem in their industry where there's all these different uh, genome assemblers that are super difficult to uh, build um, because mostly they're scientists and they're not really, con they're not computer scientists, they're, they're you know, cataloging genomes. Uh, so th they don't know how to build their, their tools. So what these guys do is they take all these genome assemblers that they have, uh, make Docker images out of them, so someone can just go Docker pull the image, run, their, run the assembler, and get their results without having to, to uh, handle that themselves. This was, this was a really cool demo that we saw. Uh, so I had a Rails dev demo. Unfortunately, uh, pretty much all my demos broke on me uh, at the last minute. Uh, but basically, this is a Rails project that I created for kind of demoing what you can do with uh, Rails as a development, uh, moving uh, Rails from a development environment to production. Uh, it has certain optimizations in it for, for the Docker build command to take advantage of some of the caching that is available. Uh, you use it to run, do your development, you do, use it to run tests, and use the same exact image for production. So let me see if I can pull that up. Are there any Rails developers here? A lot. Okay, so this, uh, so here we go. We, we have our Docker file here at the base of the repo uh, with 
all the instructions to do set, uh, install these dependencies for it, libssl, SQLite, uh, what have you, uh, and add our, add our directories. These are all like build time, um, instead of adding everything all at once, these are all build time optimizations. And then we do things like this where uh, I want to start my, my background worker. I run this image, only I say, use Sidekick. Or uh, if I want to start my unicorn, I tell it to start unicorn, but I'm always using the same exact image. I'm not building separate images to, uh, to do these different things because it's all the same code base. So one of the things that you, that you do So here I'm telling it to start bash, and so I have bash. Or I can say, apt-get update, and it's going to run apt-get update and then just destroy the container. Uh, it's pointless, but the idea is you run these commands with whatever you want it to start up. So you have the same exact image everywhere. It doesn't matter if you're running tests. It doesn't matter if you're deploying the app server or Nginx or whatever. It's all the same exact image so that you don't have discrepancies in between environments. So what is Docker? It's primarily a tool. Uh, it's for developers. Uh, one of the best use cases I have as a Ruby developer is I don't have to use RVM or RBNV or, uh, or, or CHRuby, um, all these various invented tools for managing Ruby environments. All I have to do is say Docker run Ruby and I have a Ruby environment and I can specify Docker run Ruby 2.1.2 or 1.9 and I have a fresh Ruby environment. And likewise for Python, I'm, I'm sure Python has the same version manager issue. Uh, so you don't muddy up your development laptop uh, with uh, all this version manager crap that, or even having to install all these uh, C extensions and what have you on your development laptop just to make stuff work. It is for sysadmins so that you can take that box, like the shipping container box, and plug it into your infrastructure. So you have a set of Lego, Lego bricks that you can put together. So the developer writes their application, they put their stuff in a box, they hand you the box, and you just plug it in. You have a MySQL database, you have a Redis database all set up, you plug it in as a sysadmin. The developer d doesn't have to know about your, your infrastructure at all. So it is for building systems, and it's for change. So. Uh, when I discovered Docker, it started to change the way I felt I, I was doing development. So things like being able to do, do, do Docker run Ruby are really powerful. Uh, as, as a developer, I, I, I get to um, kind of skip all the, all the crud that people have to deal with uh, in uh, managing dependencies on my laptop versus in production or on CI or what have you. And uh, for sysadmins, it's the same thing. You no longer are working, worrying about configuring applications or conf configuring services when you're pushing the prod. You are just worried about deploying a container. You say, I have this container. I have it in staging. I want to pick it up and move it over here. So these two things are intertwined. The development and system administration are they're two things, but at the same time, they are the same thing. You cannot deploy a piece of software without also, or you cannot write a piece of software without having to actually also deploy that software. And so it's about working together. So that this becomes this. Any questions? Yes. You mentioned that um, it's recommended that a single application be deployed within a single container. Mm -hmm. How do you put together more complicated environment, multiple web servers, for, for serving multiple instances of your application? Well, that's a really hot topic. So uh, the word orchestration gets thrown around a lot in the industry. Uh, so there's a lot of people trying to solve that problem. Um, Docker does it to an extent, although it's a little limited at, at the moment, uh, where we have this feature called links, 
where you tell your application, your, your, your backend application, that you need a MySQL database. So you fire up a MySQL database container, and you use the link feature to say, hey, I've got this MySQL container over here, and it will propagate some environment variables and host file information about that container. So you can just say, so you can just tell the developer to, uh, or the developer can say, uh, I have my database set up to connect to the DB host name and the Docker will handle that through aliases. So I would say dash dash link MySQL colon DB and it sets up a link from the MySQL database to uh, an alias called DB inside the container. They only work across one host. So the question was do links work across multiple hosts? They only work across one host. Uh, however, there are patterns such as the ambassador pattern where you set up uh, an ambassador on one end and on the other end that know about those. So for instance, for uh, I guess a load balancer would be a good example. A load balancer needs to know about some uh, service over on this other uh, host. So you would set up a, an ambassador here that knows about the information on that remote host, uh, but you would set up, do the linking between that ambassador and the load balancer. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned the, uh I guess the promise of Docker is that it'll work on your laptop, it'll work everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, obviously that's a oversimplification, things for example like that are in the container in the virtual image need to communicate with other stuff. Whether that's for example, if my laptop's on the VPN and it can talk to our production server as I deploy it to a new AWS instance we got, it's not going to work. Right. Um, since that, the idea of it being self-contained an image is so part and parcel to Docker, how do you communicate to people, hey, this is isolated, but, you know, asterisk, here are the ways it needs to communicate with the outside world to take care of that. So generally, uh, what we follow is the Heroku's 12-factor, 12, 12 um, I, I don't know if anybody's seen that, 12factor.net, I think is the website. Yeah, so 12-factor, where basically you do configuration through environment variables. And through that docker run command, you can inject environment variables. Uh, it would be dash E and then the name of the environment variable. And likewise, you can put environment variables into the docker file, um, overwrite those at the command line, what have you. So definitely 12 factor. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the current state of security with docker and if there are any significant concerns or things that need to be addressed if we're going to implement it in production. Yes. So. Security is actually really good, and at the same time, there are there, security is always a huge hole. Like you can always go deeper and deeper with security. Um, so generally, Docker is quite secure. So processes are uh, are isolated. Um, they can't break out of their container unless there is a bug in the kernel or or some um, prior to 1.0. We had a few oversights in our and the capabilities that we allow a root user to have inside the container, so they were able to break out and do things, uh, but those have all been taken care of at this point. Uh, then there's also things like SE Linux, where they've got this whole labeling security. How, how many people know about SE Linux? How many people have used SE Linux? Yeah, nobody, or everybody turns it off usually. You make Dan Walsh cry when you turn it off. Uh, basically, SE Linux is about applying labels to things like file system objects. So. Uh, maybe Nginx can't access uh, um, some f uh, something in Etsy password or something like that on your host. Uh, even though Nginx is running as root, it, it should not have access to Etsy password because it, it could wreak havoc on your system. So with SC Linux, they pr apply labels to make sure that even though it's root, it can't access that, that file. Um, so th there's that layer. So you'd, you would, uh, there are integrations with SC Linux and AppArmor to kind of mitigate those kind of uh, things. Uh, in addition to that, probably the next big security boon to Docker would be user namespaces, which would essentially means uh, mapping uh, external user IDs into the container. So root inside the container is not actually root outside the container, whereas right now root inside, inside the container is, even though there, we limit the capabilities, it can still be dangerous. Uh, but generally though, um, I would say even, even if we had user namespaces and everything, just don't run root <laughs> if, if you don't have to. Just don't run as root. It doesn't matter how secure it is. Don't run as root. All right, well, that's my talk. Uh, you can reach me online at CPGuy83, uh, container42, 
or if you have any questions, like I said, I'm an introvert, so just come and ask me. Uh, it may seem like I'm not interested, but I, I am. <laughs>